Today is the last of our five-part series on encounters with Jesus. And this today, as you just heard, is the account of the woman who anoints Jesus with oil. But before we begin talking about Jesus, I would like to start out with a parable written by the renowned preacher Fred Craddock. One evening, a farmer named John was heading home, and he happened to fall into an abandoned cistern. He was both proud and strong, so he said, I can get out of this place. But the sides of the cistern were mossy green and slick, and he couldn't get any leverage. So he cried out, help, help. A neighbor walked by, heard his cry, and said, John, is that you? I can't believe it. What an embarrassment you are, not only to yourself, but to your friends, your family. You are such a disgrace. Then that same neighbor went into town and told everyone he could find about John's accident and how he had taken it upon himself to tell him off. Meanwhile, John was still stuck in the hole and crying for help. Next, a couple of politicians came by, heard John, saw his plight, and said, this is terrible. This hazard should have been taken care of years ago. So they went into town, got the town council together, and passed a law. Next, they posted a sign that read, warning, anyone who falls into this cistern will be fined $25. John, still in the hole, cried out louder, help, help. Some other people heard him, checked out the situation, and said, this, this eyesore is a disgrace to our community. So they notified the beautification committee, and they came and planted azaleas and dogwoods and yellow roses. And now the area looked beautiful, but John was still stuck in the hole. Finally, without any voice left, John called out, please, somebody help me. And just then, a man came by and said, I can get you out. He got down on his knees and said, here, take my hand. And the man rescued him. That's the end of the story. Others scoffed at John, tried to penalize him, ignored him, but only one man made the effort to save him. This was the role that Jesus played as he lifted Zacchaeus from his own cistern of isolation and greed. This was the role that Jesus played as he lifted the paralytic and set him free to walk. This was the role Jesus played as he lifted up the dignity and the self-worth of the woman at the well. This was the role Jesus played as he lifted up Nicodemus, telling him that he too was born to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Yet interesting it is to notice that in today's encounter, the role is reversed. It is an unnamed woman who ministers to Jesus. Let's look again at Mark's account. It was, we are told, two days before the Passover, and Jesus is on the way to the cross. Now he knows that his life is seriously in danger, and since time is of the essence one might wonder if it wouldn't have made more sense for him to meet with some high-powered strategists. 
But where does Jesus go? To the home of Simon the leper. The leper! Socially, it would have been hard to go lower on the totem pole than to the house of a leper. Yet that matter aside, from the vantage point of an outsider, what happened next would have seemed even more bizarre. All of a sudden, a woman bursts into the room, breaks open an alabaster jar, and begins to pour ointment over Jesus' head. This behavior would have been unusual at any time in history, but particularly in this context because women were not to be seen or heard. They belonged in the kitchen. Yes, it might be acceptable for a woman to answer the door when a guest arrives, but after that, it was time to vamoose. She would certainly not have been a welcomed addition to the gathering. Secondly, and this is from the eyes of the outsider, she would have been offensive. Because in addition to being an uninvited guest, she appeared to be mentally disturbed. While it was customary to honor guests by dabbing their foreheads with a drop or two of perfume, this woman doesn't know when to stop. She breaks the jar and dumps the contents on Jesus' head, leaving him drenched in oil. It was dripping down on his plate, down into his lap. It was disgusting. And she didn't even make an effort to mop it up. Thirdly, in their eyes, she had probably gone off the deep end in a buying frenzy wherein she purchased more than 300 denarii's worth of ointment. That's almost a year's worth of wages. And so now, what was she doing pouring it on the floor? Didn't she realize that to Jesus this would have been a travesty to waste that kind of money? Particularly when surrounding them were thousands of people who were both homeless and hungry. But that wasn't Jesus' response. Instead, he defends her, saying, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good service for me. The NIV, that's the New International Version, translates the Greek word kalos, not as good, but as beautiful. She has done a beautiful thing for me. And I like that translation better. After trying three years and unsuccessfully to make his disciples understand the nature of his mission and his inevitable sacrifice, this unnamed woman somehow got it. The word Messiah literally means the anointed one. And so when she anoints him with oil, she is revealing to him that she recognizes him. She knows him to be the king of kings. She knew that he was, in fact, the Messiah. But she knew more than that. When she poured that ointment on his head, she also broke the jar. And as many times as I had heard this story, not until this year did I understand that detail because I couldn't understand why she couldn't just dump out the oil without the breakage. Why did she have to break the jar? Because, as it happens, according to traditional burial rites, it was the custom to bury the shards of an alabaster jar in the tomb, along with the corpse. And so, as she broke that jar and drenched his body in oil, she was doing what people usually did when they prepared a body for burial. She was revealing that even as the Messiah, she knew that he was going to have to suffer and die. 
No one else could comprehend how God could accomplish his purposes through suffering, certainly not the disciples. But this unnamed woman happens to understand. Her ministry to Jesus was a ministry of presence. There was nothing she could do to change his fate. She could not stop the crucifixion from happening. She could not take away any of the physical suffering that was soon to come to him. But she could, for this one brief moment in time, show him her love through compassion, come meaning with, passion meaning to suffer. She could and she did suffer with him in this moment. And the impact that that singular action had on him and that gift of a year's worth of, age, of wages was impossible to measure. Jesus himself used the strongest language any of us can take in when he said, truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. My guess is that that one act of kindness came to him that day as a beam of light in a hideously dark place in his life. And it was as if that light came from the very heart of God. The other day, I officiated at a memorial service for Sheila Matthews' aunt, wherein her life verse was cited as a quotation of Stephen Grillet, and you know it. I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. I can't help but wonder if that particular motto didn't characterize this woman in Bethany, who at such a critical time in Jesus' life seized the moment and did what her heart asked of her. Did she ever know the impact her kindness had on him? Or, for that matter, can anyone know the impact of a divinely inspired good deed? This past week, I had the experience of a missed opportunity. A dear friend, a parishioner, a second mother from my first church in Madison when I had no family to call my own that lived right there in Minnesota. She took me in, she welcomed me, and made me throughout these years always feel a part of the family. And her birthday was on March 4th. I certainly remembered that. But because of her hard of hearing, being, because of the fact that she was hard of hearing, I didn't make my usual call. I knew it would create confusion. And I decided that I would send that birthday card to her instead. As it happened, the date that I sent the card was the date of her death. And I don't know that in the throes of her pneumonia it would have mattered at all if she had been told on her birthday that she had received a card from me. But it was a missed opportunity. And so it is throughout our lives, every day we have not missed opportunities, but opportunities before us to seize the day. Carpe diem. Yet whatever happens regardless, the mystery, the holy mystery, is that whenever we do put ourselves out there, and whenever we do make the effort to lift up another in love, we in turn discover that our souls have been lifted by virtue of the fact that we, like that woman, did something beautiful for God. The message of this morning, carpe diem with goodness, while the opportunity still presents itself. This led throughout the past five weeks, we've been on a journey. 
Remembering how, by God's grace, Jesus redeemed not only biblical characters, Zacchaeus in his greed, the paralytic in his guilt, the woman at the well in her shame, Nicodemus in his perplexity, and now today's woman in Bethany in her generosity. But as we have heard their stories, we are also reminded of our own, those ways in which Jesus continually intervenes in our lives and redeems us. But best of all is the fact that these miraculous stories of Jesus will continue forever. And finally, together, we will be proclaiming both his resurrection and ours too. Thanks be to God for his goodness and his faithfulness. Amen.